it started with uh, a near-death experience I had when I was seven years old, and it had a profound effect on me, so that when I studied psychology, I was very interested in uh, what happens in the brain when such kind of things uh, occur. And when I started working as a therapist, I tried to find way uh, to induce such kind of uh, states of consciousness into um, therapy, for, for, to use them in therapy um, to help my clients. So I um, thought that it could be a good idea finding ways to simulate such kind of experience to stimulate the effect. And I started with doing hypnosis, uh, inducing a trance state, and then uh, using uh, the, the typical uh, pattern of a near-death experience as a kind of suggestion for the clients uh, to go into that light experience. And as some of the clients had quite difficulties uh, sitting with closed eyes in a trance-like state and trying to imagine a bright light, so they tried so hard imagining that the light that they brought themselves out of the trance state so I started using an external light uh, so that when they are sitting in front of me, closed eyes, and I said, imagine now a white light coming closer and closer. Then I turned on the light and uh, that had a profound effect. Uh, even such an effect that uh, I was uh, quite surprised by what they told after those uh, therapy sessions. Uh, so that was the, the, the point when I uh, joined Dirk Berkel, uh, my friend and a neurologist, uh, to uh, ask him what he thinks about that. And uh, so we started doing EEG research and it was his idea to combine uh, the steady light which, with, with which I was working at that time with a strobe. Uh, first the idea was to uh, simulate the tunnel experience, which is also a quite common feature in the near-death experience. Um, yeah, but uh, when we had our first prototype of uh, Lucia built, which was an old espresso machine <laughs> in, <laughs> in the office, uh, then uh, we found out immediately that what happened there was a lot more than we expected. To look at it from the scientific way, uh, uh, we can say that our brain has uh, some job to do for us to get in contact with the world and to synchronize our personality, our attitudes, our emotions with the experience we, we do with the world. And that was the point uh, to see that light has a very strong impact on us, a very positive impact and a very positive results on our life. So uh, the question, question was how to put the attraction of the brain to the uh, light. And uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, if you have changes in time or space of the object of your perception, the brain looks at these things. It pays attention to these outer things. And that was the principle to integrate the flickering light because we have changes in time and all the time uh, there comes a new signal, the brain puts attention of this object. So at this point we have um, a way to um, uh, intensify the experience of light. We took some characteristics some from personal experience, some from scientific uh, experiences and results and combined it and so we find a way uh, how to look at light and moreover than this uh, by looking at the object of light you can say the light is not only in the objective world it's also in our experienced world in our so-called inner world and by making the experience we can activate the uh, psychological source of brightness, of light, of uh, being open to something. And that's not the same and not only the brightness and the light of the physical world. 
Um, and by this we can open a kind of portal to an experience that's completely new. And uh, we come very close to a point when we not only focus on the light on the outside, but we focus on some brightness, some light inside us, and open the gate to, to a so-called inner world, maybe, and intensify this experience and take it into our, our outer world. And by this point we come into a kind of communication, not only the communication of the brain with the light, but communication of our ego with our outer world. And we can see that uh, by this light experience, we can see that uh, it's not only that our brain is a passive element of our outer world, but by the experience we can see that we are also taking influence on our percepted world. And this is a point where uh, we uh, come very close to ourselves, to the experience, to the moment, and be open to new ideas, new elements, like in some uh, states of consciousness that are extraordinary, for example, the light experience and the near-death experience, or in some other situation where you can have altered states of consciousness, psychedelic experiences, for example. What the lamp uh, does, it, it can be described the best way, just like um, metaphoric, uh, we, can, we can use the metaphor of music. If you hear one tone and after a while a second tone, you have heard single events. If you put the tones into a relationship with one another by nearing them, uh, then the brain starts hearing music. Uh, the music is not in the tone, it is made by the brain. And we are doing the same thing with the lamp, uh, but with frequencies, not with a single tone. So we're changing frequencies, and by, cha by the changing of the frequencies, um, the brain connects them in a way as it does with the tone. So it is a kind of optical music, which, which is a result. And it's a a sensation of indescribable beauty. In the ancient Greek mystery cults, uh, the people went into caves and did some kind of, um, or used some kind of uh, mind, uh, 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 changing their state of mind, changing their uh, consciousness and they, they inhaled uh, psychoactive gases or did made a fire and put a wheel in front of the fire, turning the wheel and looking through the uh, turning wheel and having a flickering effect in, that, uh, effect in that way. Also in the medial ages, people went with carriages through alleys, looking through the, um, the trees uh, into the setting sun with closed eyes and um, could also by uh, uh, changing the speed of the carriage uh, have an influence on their uh, perception. And the interesting thing is that uh, in, in the ancient Greek mystery cults, uh, for instance, Permenides describes his experience as an experience of uh, unimaginable beauty, of colors and forms he never have seen before, uh, so that for him it was a kind of divine experience. And the more the people allowed themselves tuning into that beauty, the more they get out of it, uh, which never could be uh, told before what, what will be the outcome. And so that's also the reason that we um, went away, more or less, from the therapeutic background we developed it out of, uh, into the art business, because um, it is a kind of art uh, experience created by yourself. So when in uh, classical art, the artist is the one who makes the artwork and the audience is just uh, a passive uh, consuming uh, audience or, or uh, observer. observer, yeah, observer. Um, in modern art, it, modern art goes a step further. Uh, the artist creates a piece of art but the observer has to recognize it, 
as a piece of art. If he does not do that, then it is not a piece of art. So uh, the, the piece of art is the result of a collaboration between the artist and the observer. We are going a step further by um, in, inducing different frequencies in a way that the one sitting in front of the lamp with closed eyes is creating his own piece of art because that's the way the brain reacts on the changing frequencies and the constant light. And it, he creates it by watching it and it's always new and it's always uh, fresh. And even if someone seeing the same changing frequencies uh, more than one time, he sees everything, something totally different. Yeah, and it's going further even more because it's not only something that's happening in the gallery, it's also happening in uh, every day's life. We are artists in uh, producing our life and creating our life. And uh, by uh, making it possible to experience it, by looking into a flickering light in combination with a constant light, we go to the point that you can experience that you are an artist in your life and you can create it as wonderful as you want to do it. And by the way, the many shamanic traditions and also healing traditions have used this uh, fundamental function of our brain to look at the world with other eyes. And as soon as you look at the world with other eyes, it has already happened. And it's also interesting <coughs> from a psychological point of view that uh, people all over the world at every time have had a drive uh, to go into that state of consciousness. Even children uh, tend to stimulate their brain producing such kind of state of consciousness by uh, uh, doing it that way and looking into the light. Uh, Usually it's the parents, when they see doing their children, they say, stop it, you might uh, cause uh, harm to your eyes. And so they get, the, uh, their children, they get afraid by uh, doing that. But uh, humanity always has a lot of uh, techniques uh, to, to do that change of consciousness. Uh, consciousness. And so we, um, from a scientific point of view, have to say, that it is the brain itself which, lo which longs for that. <laughs> what is mind and yeah. <laughs> uh, what is structure? <laughs> well, we could look at it as a structure uh, and as a function. By concentrating on a topic, by concentrating on a part of the body, the brain builds up new connections, new neuronal synapses. By this way, uh, we could say by concentrating, by making experiences, the brain is creating itself and creating also the structure of the brain. We have a new structure of it after having made experiences. So it's building up from uh, the mind at the same time. Yeah, m m maybe the mind is a... Um, uh, and the structure is one and the same. The, com the more complex the structure, the more complex the mind, because there is no difference between energy and matter. There is no difference between mind and brain. It's just the same seen from, from two different sides. And um, it, it's interesting that uh, when we've been at the Science and Non-Duality, uh, not at that, at the Towards the Science of Consciousness conference in Stockholm, there was uh, Roger Penrose uh, having a talk and he talked exactly about that, that maybe uh, science uh, had to focus on the wrong side of, uh, of the uh, whole thing by looking just into matter and missing that uh, the, whole, the, the real essential thing is on the other side where those uh, dynamics happen out of which matter arises by watching it. So everything which seems to us as matter, as real, is just a process of watching or measuring it. And uh, so, in the end, there is no difference between mind and uh, matter or brain and mind. 
I hope that artists can do that, what religion and science failed to do. Um, religion and science, first religion then science, uh, was meant, easily said, to help people being better people. And what they learned people is uh, how to be much better than they are. Uh, by making differences. And um, art, I think, is, I hope that, is a more uh, integrative concept by not wanting to change something but wanting to show something. And um, so I think <laughs> we could say art is our last chance. <laughs> Because when art also fails, what else do we have? Also, always worked with creativity. And uh, some uh, uh, authorities in science as well as in religion are not very open to creativity. It should go the way that it goes. Yeah, I think art has an anti-authority... Anti-authority... Anti uh, where, where is the word? Anti-authoritarian, anti anti-nationalist. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> anti-authoritarian um, aspect, yeah. and authorities uh, are usually <laughs> something, <laughs> something we don't like, <laughs> and artists usually don't like authorities as well because authorities are just needed out of one reason because people are afraid of themselves and authorities they work with as a, with this anxiety uh, authorities uh, um, pretend helping us by making our life safer and uh, that's the trick of authorities but they're doing just the other thing um, so Maybe art is a possibility of taking uh, humankind, the anxiety from itself. Uh, because the only thing one is afraid of is, his self, is of, his, of himself. And uh, art could be a way of reducing that anxiety by showing what one really is. And seeing that beauty, you cannot be afraid of. And I think that's also the reason why authorities uh, at every time try to do all they can to prevent people from going into that state of consciousness. Because if someone has reached, reached that state of consciousness, he cannot believe in authorities because uh, he sees that there is no legitimacy for them. They no, no longer need them. Yeah. And, yeah, sort of being in a sort of a creative mode or mindset, uh, you're considering a lot more options anyway and possibly bringing, uh, trying to find uh, relations between two um, previously perceived separate maybe concepts and bringing them together and this is, uh, you could describe as the act of creativity where you're finding something common between two things that are seen as not having a relation between each other mm -hmm. and putting them in a new context. Uh, and this yes. is something that can be seen as beautiful and also um, inventive and, um, and uh, sort of new. Yes. At the moment there is uh, one lamp at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich and there is Professor Ralf Buchner uh, working with his students in a way that he gives them, uh, gives them access to Lucia as much as they want and encourages them uh, to produce their works in a way however they want and uh, he's interested in how this experience affects their work and um, at the moment uh, they, the whole thing is in the, uh, in the end of, the, of that uh, yeah, yeah. phase, the I think. Yeah, the end of the semester. The end of the yeah. semester and they produced lots of works and they were able to document uh, the development of in, in their works and it's a, a very fantastic thing uh, to see uh, what, they, what they have done. They will show it um, in the midst of February 
at an exhibition yeah. or a day of open doors or how uh, you call it? On the 7th of, uh, 17th, 17th of, of February, February yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Very good. But uh, Ralf Buchner and his students are that uh, uh, um, amazed by this uh, whole thing that they uh, they um, they support, support uh, nice. yeah. They support this technology very much, and uh, so there will be a lot of activities uh, in the southern part of Germany in that year. I think it's just necessary to say that one should not overestimate Lucia. It's just a way uh, of doing it out of many many ways, and I think. Uh, where everybody should look for the best way for himself. There might be some people uh, who can use Lucia for the best to go into that psychedelic states, but there are lots of other techniques and lots of other ways of uh, going into that, and no way is better or worse than the other. It's just uh, a very individual thing for everyone, so uh, everybody has to find the technique works best for him.